So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Dishan, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Karim. Uh, I work at the University of Alberta uh, in the Maple Lab, which is the name of my group, a very Canadian name for the lab. Um, and today's topic, or today's talk, I would like to talk to you about whether program analysis is the silver bullet against software bugs or not. So let me first start by asking this question. How many of you here has developed any kind of software just by humming? Um. Awesome. How many of you have developed bug-free software? <laughs> all right, great. So we all know that software cannot be bug-free. Inevitably, your software has to have bugs. And these bugs can range from simple programming errors like the infamous go-to-fail error that Apple had in their iOS uh, code base that led to accepting invalid SSL and, TS and TLS connections. Or it could be more fatal in the case of some race conditions due to poor testing in the software that ran the anti-lock braking system in Toyota cars that unfortunately led to some fatal accidents, but it also led to Toyota losing about $3 billion from recalls from the cars that had that software. Or it could be life-threatening bugs, like accepting unencrypted, unauthenticated remote connections to some medical implants. And this, was, this snapshot here is as recent as the uh, March 2019, so just six months ago, uh, from a report by the Department of Homeland Security that basically says that some of those medical implants would allow a remote attacker to connect to them. Imagine an, uh, an insulin pump, for example. They can control it remotely without having any authentication with that medical implant. And today, I would like to make the bold claim that program analysis can actually detect these software bugs and even fix them in some cases. And hopefully, by the end of the talk today, I will convince you that that is the case. So what is program analysis and how, we can, or how program analysis can actually help us with these software bugs? So generally speaking, program analysis is a, a way of reasoning about the runtime behavior of the program without necessarily having to run it. So we're trying to know what the program would, would do when it executes without having to execute it. So in general, as Sriram said in today's talk in the morning, we can reduce that problem of reasoning about the runtime behavior of the program to the halting problem. And Rice's theorem, basically, an interpretation of it, tell us that for any interesting property, PR, of the, behavior, of the runtime behavior of a program, it's almost impossible to write an analysis that can tell us for sure for any generic program, for any general input, whether that property holds or not. And interesting here means, the word interesting property here means that it's a property about the semantics of the code that doesn't necessarily always hold to be true, and it's neither always false. So it, it's not something syntactic about the program, like, for example, does it have an if statement? Does it have a for loop? These kind of things you can just know by just looking at the code of the program and, and, and know it right there. But it's something semantic about the program. So are we really doomed then? Like, what do we do in the program analysis community? So by definition, it's undecidable. So do we just give up and not do anything about it? As stubborn as we are, we don't do that. What we set it for then, and not quite, as, as, uh, as you can see here. So we, we, don't, we are not going to set it for the undecidability of program analysis. So what we do instead is that we are going to settle for an over-approximation of that property. We're happy to get an approximation of that property without executing the program. And the whole research area of program analysis is all about trying to get that approximation as close as possible or as good as possible. So what do I mean by this? So you can have a program, you run an analysis on that program, and then the analysis can try to validate whether a property exists in that program or not. So it will tell you yes, if the property exists, or it will tell you maybe. I don't know. So a safe approximation for that would be maybe. On the other hand, you can run the analysis to invalidate a certain property of the program, in which case you are expecting the answer to be no, or of course, the, the analysis can always return the safe answer, maybe. And again, the goal of our community is just to make those maybes as few as possible from the results of the analysis. So you want to make the result of the analysis be mostly either yes or no, depending on the property you're trying to uh, predict, uh, verify in the, in the program. So program analysis is actually quite useful. And it's used in many, uh, in many contexts. So it's used in compiler optimizations converting your, your code from sequential to being run in parallel, uh, constant propagation, dead code elimination, some of the standard optimizations that compiler apply to make your code run better, static method inlining. So if most of you have used the compiler at one point or the other. So it uses program analysis internally to do that. Developer support tools, code navigation, if you want to know uses of your methods, uh, references of a method, 
code refactoring tools if you want to rename a variable, uh, or code recommender system if anybody here has used an integrated development environment like IntelliJ or VS Code or Eclipse. If you hit control space, you get a list of all the methods that you can call on an object that internally uses a, a program analysis to reason about the context uh, around that piece of code that you're writing to tell you how or the recommended uh, list of methods that could be called. It's also used in program verification a lot to make sure that certain softwares and critical, uh, safety critical systems uh, adhere to certain standards. So if you wanna make sure that a space shuttle when, you, when it goes up in space, it doesn't blow up. So you don't have the luxury of testing this with multiple space shuttles uh, to be able to understand that, yeah, my software actually runs. Or if you have an MRI machine, you don't wanna, you don't wanna try this ideally on human beings before you actually deploy it to, to patients who would use it. You wanna make sure that the software actually is correct before uh, 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 patients can use it. And it's also used a lot also in the security domain and finding bugs, so uh, like find bugs, for example, FlowDroid, Coverity, uh, HP45, all of these are security analysis tools that try to detect security vulnerabilities in your code. So it seems that program analysis is quite useful in many domains. However, throughout the years, I realized that developers typically try to avoid using program analysis tools, specifically static analysis tools, in practice. And the reason I think why that is the case is threefold. The first part is scalability. The analyses may not scale to large code bases that nowadays specifically is uh, 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 more dominant than before. The second reason is precision. You may get too many false positives that just are annoying to developers and disrupt their workflow. So they just give up on using static analysis or program analysis tools. And the third reason is usability. Maybe the analysis is not well integrated into their development workflow that they have to context switch back and forth uh, between tools to be able to get the results of the analysis. And today I would like to talk to you about each one of these challenges and some of the contributions that my group has been uh, doing in the last few years to address each one of them. And I will focus more on scalability and precision, but I will quickly touch upon usability towards the end of my talk as well. So before I do that, I'd like to acknowledge all the collaborators with whom I have collaborated uh, on the contributions that I will talk about today. Um, and these collaborators are some of my students, some of my mentors, and also some of my uh, industry partners that I have uh, worked with. And specifically, Andre Lotek, my PhD uh, advisor at Waterloo, where the whole story began. So that began all the way back in 2010, where I was just starting my PhD at the University of Waterloo. And you can tell that it was almost 10 years ago because I had a lot more hair back then than now. Um, so I came in from my master's degree. I did my master's also at Waterloo, but in network security. So quite a different domain. Uh, I only took one course in my grad school about programming languages, which was also with Andre. Uh, and then I started my PhD with him. And the first question I had was, where do I begin? What do I do now in my PhD? I have no idea what I want to do. I, I know I want to do something in programming languages, but I don't know what to do exactly. So Andre's answer to that was, why don't you start reading this paper? And that was that paper here. If I just focus here on the title of that paper, the title says, Automatic Construction of Accurate Application Call Graph with Library Call Abstraction for Java. And that's a paper by Wei Li Zhang and Barbara Ryder. I had no idea what that title meant. There were just too many buzzwords in the title that I didn't know what they mean. What is a call graph? What is that? Is that a special type of graph? And obviously there has to be something to do with the application, so that means that there must be something to do with the library as well, and what does that mean? And of course it has to be accurate. Nobody wants an inaccurate call graph, right? <laughs> what is call abstraction? What are we abstracting? And how we are abstracting that call? Again, library shows up here, so there is an application part, there is a library part, and I need, didn't know how they interact with each other. And of course, you wanna do this automatically, nobody wants to do this manually by hand. And it has Java in the title, so that means it's different doing this for Java, obviously, compared to other languages. So I didn't understand why are the reasons behind that. So I wanted to demystify some of these uh, buzzwords that I didn't, and these terms that I didn't understand back then. And one thing that you usually do when you start uh, uh, looking at a research problem, you start reading one paper and you just branch out, read more papers to try to understand even a single line or a single statement in that paper. And then you come back to that paper later on to continue where you left off, maybe, maybe even a few months later after you have uh, compiled enough knowledge to be able to understand that paper. And that's exactly what I did. The first thing I wanted to understand is what is a call graph? 
So after reading a few papers, specifically two of them that I will show here, one is the paper by Frank Tipp and Jens Pelsberg uh, that basically uh, explains different types of call graph analyses with different levels of precision uh, uh, for, the, for the Java bytecode, for, basically for the Java language. And the other paper that also was intriguing, which was published a year before I started my PhD uh, by Martin Bravenbohr and Yanis Markdakis that shows basically an analysis framework that uses data log as a language to define the analysis, which was really nice because you can just focus on the logic of what your analysis is doing without having to figure out how the analysis is actually computing the work. You just define the rules and then the rules are automatically handled by the data log engine. So reading these two papers and more, I was able to understand that, well, a call graph is just a fancy name for a data structure that represents the calling relationships in your program. So if you have a method invocation, you want to know what are the potential calls that could, be hap that could happen at that method invocation at runtime, and a call graph would tell you that. Basically, a set of call edges or a set of reachable methods in your program. And it turns out that this is a very important data structure because that data structure is required for every single interprocedural analysis that you may think of. An interprocedural analysis means an analysis that crosses the boundaries of methods in your program. And once you cross the boundary of the method, you want to know where you're going to go next if there's a method invocation. And a call graph would guide you. It's basically a map of the program that will tell you where to go uh, if you have a method invocation. So let's build a call graph. This is a code in Java. I uh, have a main method. There's a main, uh, sorry, I have a main class which has only one main method, which is the entry point of the program, a bunch of statements, a small abstract class, and two classes that inherit from it. So according to Java, the first thing that is the main entry of your program is the public static main method, right? So that will be the first node that we're going to have in the call graph. Following from that node, we have in the if statement a creation of an object of type circle. So we're just going to call the constructor of circle. So we're calling circle.init. And according to the semantics of the Java language, when you construct an object, you will keep calling all the constructors all the way up to the top of the hierarchy with this Java lang object. So in this case, we're calling shape.init and then object.init. So that just happens just because of the call to circle.init or constructing a circle object. Then, of course, because we are doing program analysis, we want to reason about all possible execution paths of the program. And so far, we only looked at the if statement, not the else. So now looking at the else statement, we have a construction of a different object, which is of type square. And in that case, we're going to call square.init. And then, uh, uh, and then we're going to call uh, uh, shape.init again, because it's a superclass of square which will eventually also call a Java lang object. So you see here that we're trying to abstract away from the actual runtime behavior by uh, including all the possible calls that can happen at runtime. So we, we don't know what exactly is the concrete execution that the program will take. That's why the abstraction comes in place to know what could possibly happen with these method calls at runtime. And then the last method that we have, the last statement is s.draw. And because we have an object of type circle and an object of type square, we think, or the analysis would think, that there could be dispatched uh, that method uh, s.draw to either circle.draw or square.draw. So here we go. We have a call graph now for that Java uh, program. So that's great. So now going back to the paper that I started everything with, now I know what a call graph is. Good. I know how to create that for my application. I just used a toy example to figure out what that means. I know how to do that for Java now. I read a whole bunch of papers that talk about call graph analysis for Java, so I felt happy about that. I also know what a call abstraction is, because like I just said, you're trying to abstract away from the actual runtime behavior of the program by figuring out what are the potential execution paths the program can take, and then reasoning about them to create the call graph with all possible calls that can happen at runtime. And I was able to do this automatically because I created or I wrote an analysis in that data log based uh, analysis framework dupe that does this call graph analysis for me. But the two things that I still didn't understand were how to do this accurately and what does the library has to do with this code? How does it interact with the application code? So I thought, okay, let's try to build a call graph for the largest program in Java that I can think of at the time, and it's Java C, the Java compiler. And let's see what happens here. So what I did is that I implemented that call graph analysis and used a, an open source data log engine called Iris. And the Java C uh, bytecode there uh, wasn't really too much. It was also, at that time, it was Java 1.4. 
Uh, only a half megabyte of class files, so not, not many classes that I'm, that I'm dealing with. And I had a powerful machine with eight gigabytes of RAM at the time. So I said, okay, I can do this. So I ran the analysis multiple times. The problem is that each time the analysis would just take hours to finish. And I didn't know why is that the case. But that wasn't the worst part. The worst part is that every single time I end up, the term, term, program terminates with that error. Out of memory error, Java heap space. Regardless of how much heap space I would dedicate to my, uh, to my process. I can give it all the eight gigabytes of RAM, doesn't matter. Always runs out of memory. So I didn't know why that is the case. Why, why is it so difficult to uh, reason about that program? But I thought, okay, maybe I took it too far. Maybe the Java compiler is, after all, a large code base. Maybe I should try something smaller. So I went to the other extreme. Smallest program I can ever write in Java, a Hello World program. And this is how a Hello World program would look in Java. Just a simple class with a simple main method that prints out the string Hello World. And I ran it on the same iris reasoner with the same data log based analysis that I had, but it also took a bit of time. It wasn't too much time as the other analysis for the Java compiler, but it still took a considerable amount of time. So I thought, well, maybe something is wrong with my analysis. I'm still starting my PhD, so maybe I made some mistakes here and there. Maybe the analysis engine itself is not optimized as much as it should be, so that's why it's taking too much time. So I thought, okay, I'll just try a different analysis framework, which is Soot, one of the um, uh, most prominent analysis frameworks in academia, and it's used nowadays also in some parts of industry that started also at, uh, um, at the University of McGill in Canada by Laurie Hendren and her group. Um, and I ran the analysis that's already built in in Soot on that Hello World example. How long do you think the analysis took to finish? Hours. Hours. Okay. Anybody else? Microseconds. So we have hours and microseconds. <laughs> Anybody in between? Days. days. Was that days? <laughs> All right. So it actually took about more, roughly a little bit more than 30 seconds to get the code graph for that Hello World program. So not microseconds, not hours, definitely not days, but still, like, why do I need 30 seconds to get a code graph for a one statement in my code? And then I get a code graph with more than 5,000 reachable methods and more than 23,000 edges in the core graph. So looking at this code, I was like, what's happening here? I only have one method, so I'm expecting to have maybe two edges, maybe three edges at the most. What is going on there? So again, reading more papers, more and more papers about core graph analysis, I realized that the code that you see up here, or up here, uh, it's just your code. And for the analysis to be able to analyze your program, it has to bring in all the library dependencies that your code depends on. And because here you're calling system out line, so it has to bring in all the standard library, all the relevant parts in the standard library to be able to run the analysis properly and to give you a complete result for the analysis. So it's not just the code that you wrote as a developer that is being analyzed, but also all its library dependencies. Okay, and this is actually a visualization of that code here. <laughs> so this is, I kid you not, this is how you would uh, visualize it using GraphVis, for example. Maybe, maybe, maybe the two methods down there on, on the right-hand side or something. But all that web of calls and edges are what's happening in the library, things that you as a developer couldn't care less what's going on there. All what you need to know is which method I'm calling in the library, and that's it. I don't care what's happening in there. All right, so of course if you are a developer and using this in an IDE like Eclipse or IntelliJ or whatever, and you want to navigate through your code, you don't want to see that graph there. So that's something that really bugged me at the time, and I wanted to know what is the reason and how can I solve it. But anyways, going back to my paper that I started with, now I understand what it means to have an accurate call graph, because that call graph is not accurate. I'm, I'm just getting too much noise. And I also know now how the library can interact with the application in ways that make the analysis really imprecise. How can we resolve that? How can we do that? So the first thing I asked myself, Am I alone? Am I the only one who has had this problem before? So reading more papers, going to mailing lists, uh, specifically the mailing list for Soot, I found out that actually many other researchers and practitioners have found the same problem or have bumped into the same problem before. They don't care about the library nodes. They don't care what happens in the library. They just need to focus on their application code. And then you will see things like uh, ignoring the library would be unsound. What does unsound mean? I didn't know at the time what unsound means. Um, but obviously all what they were asking for is a way to do partial program analysis. 
So how, do, how can we get uh, a holistic overview of what the program will do by only analyzing parts of it, rather than analyzing it all, including all its library dependencies? But the trick part here is to do this in a sound and precise way. That's what people wanted. So to clarify that, let's assume that this is the call graph of your program. So the white uh, circles here are the nodes or methods in your program. I just removed all the edges just to make it a bit more clear. So ideally, your ideal call graph would be that uh, call graph here. But again, because we can reduce every problem in program analysis to the halt from the halting problem, the getting the ideal call graph reduces from the halting problem. So we cannot compute that call graph. So what typical program analyses or call graph analyses do is that they perform what I call whole program analysis. They get your program, you get your application code, all the library dependencies, put them in together, throw them at the analysis, get the result to give you an, a safe over approximation of the runtime behavior of the program. What if you don't want to do that? What if you want to do sound and precise partial program analysis? You have one of two options. First option is you can either say, I don't care about the library. I don't care what happens there. The library cannot affect me, my code in any way. So you just get an incomplete view of what the world looks like for your application code. But you still get some result. But that result is incomplete. And if you're using this call graph in a client analysis that depends on its result, then the results of that analysis is also incomplete. The other way around, the other extreme would be to say, well, I don't know what the library is doing still, but I'm just going to assume it can do anything. It can call any method, can create any object, can modify any field, and so on and so forth. But that's really imprecise. What we really want to do is have something in the sweet spot in between, something that can still be as close as, precisely as close to uh, the whole program analysis, but still without analyzing any code in the library, because you may either not have that code or just maybe too much code to analyze in the first place. So to address that problem, we define what we call the separate compilation assumption. So what that assumption states is the following. It states that all of the library classes in a language like Java can be compiled in the absence of application classes. So that's a very simple, fair assumption to make, yet it's very powerful because it allows us to define a lot of constraints about how the library interacts with the application. So it defines things like what classes can exist in the library, what classes in the application can inherit from the classes in the library, what objects or classes in the application the library can instantiate and can have access to, access to fields, arrays, local variables in the library. Uh, method calls or callbacks, which is the main reason why a partial program analysis may be unsound or imprecise, and so on and so forth. Today, I would just like to highlight two of these constraints, local variables and uh, method calls, because they are the most important ones that make the separate compilation assumption work actually in practice. So the first one is the library points to set, or the local variables in the library. So as you can see here, I'm just separating the code in the application versus the code in the library in this cloud. The application code stays the same. The separate compilation assumption does not change anything in that code. It stays the same. So you still have all the variables. You still have the points to sets that tell you what are the heap allocations that these variables may point to at runtime. So everything stays the same there. In the library, since we are not analyzing any code, we don't have any local variables. But we still need that information about the heap allocations that they may point to to be able to get a sound and a complete call graph. So instead, we have a summary points to set called LPT, or library points to set, that you can think of, it, of this set as the union of all the local variables in the original library code that we are not analyzing. So that's a substitution for the original library code. All right. Now the next, uh, the next constraint that's also really important is callbacks. How do we, without knowing the actual calls in the library, how do we know which methods in the application the library can call back, like event handlers and so on and so forth? So the separate compilation assumption has two conditions for a callback to happen. So in this case, we have an application code a.m, and we will say that the library can call back that method if two conditions are satisfied. The first one is the library should know about that method somehow. Like the library cannot call a method that it doesn't know about. So it has to know the signature of that method. And the way to be able to know that, assuming there is no reflection, of course, is by the application class A extending the library class L and overriding that class M. So that way, the library can know that. And we can know that from looking at the class structure of the library without having to look at the code in the library itself. But that condition alone is not enough. The second condition, which relates to the library points to set, states that 
there has to be an object of compatible type, which means the type of the declared class or a subclass of it, that is in the library points to set. So if you have these two conditions, that allows the library to have a callback. And since it allows the library to have a callback, we're just going to assume that this callback may happen and make the analysis computed. So for example, if you have, a, if you have an application class B that still satisfies the first condition, but there is no object of type B or a subclass of B in the LPT, so there will be no callback just to make the analysis more precise. Same thing for C.M, even though that M may have the same signature, but since there is no relationship between C and L in the class hierarchy, then there will be no callback there. And these, these two conditions and these two constraints, library callbacks and the library points to set, are very essential to having a precise and complete call graph analysis without analyzing the library in the code, uh, the, lib uh, the code in the library. All right, so now that we have this separate compilation, uh, compilation assumption, we want to enable wider use of it across any analysis framework without having to change that analysis framework and without having to change the code in the application. And to do that, we implemented a system called Averroist that does the following. It gets in three parameters, your application code, any library dependencies that you may have, which we can substitute by just a description of that library just to know what the methods are. And optionally, it can even receive information in a plain text format that tells it what are the uses of reflection in the original uh, library that we had. And then Averroist runs a bunch of static analyses that just looks at the structure of the code. So it does not analyze any code in the application or the library. It just looks at the class hierarchy, signatures of methods, signatures of fields, and the, the entries in the constant pool of the class files. So like strings and integers and values like that to simulate or to reason about uh, what maybe, for example, what reflection could do if it concatenates a couple of strings to figure out the name of a class to be instantiated and so on. And the output of Averroes is a jar file that encodes all the constraints of the separate compilation assumption as explicit bytecode instructions. So you can use this jar file instead of the original jar file for all the libraries, along with the application code, in any analysis framework that understands class files, which is all of the analysis frameworks that analyze Java programs, and you would automatically have support for partial program analysis without analyzing the library code without changing as well any code in your analysis. You just need to use that jar file instead of the original jar file for the library. And you automatically get the benefit of the separate compilation assumption without analyzing the whole program. So how does Averroes fare in practice? So in the experiments that we have done in the past, we found that we are able to reduce the size of the library by 600 times just using Averroes. And that huge reduction in the size of the code that the analysis has to handle leads to the analysis being, a call graph analysis to be seven times faster than before and use up to six times less memory than before. So you can see that the reduction of the code just, just doesn't uh, also affect both the runtime performance of the analysis but also how much memory it could use. And that relates back to that memory heap space error that I kept getting before because just the analysis can't handle all the data structures that it needs to maintain to create uh, a complete result. And the most important part about this is that from our evaluation, we were able to show that the analysis produces precise and sound results. So we actually have a formal proof that says that the, that the results are sound. And we also show, compa compared to the whole program analysis, that we still have a call graph analysis within a reasonable precision to what you would get if you would have analyzed the library. So I'm also really happy to say that Averroes does work in practice. It's actually used now in all the three uh, popular frameworks that we have in academia. Some of them are also from industry, like Walla, for example. It's the analysis framework from IBM. Uh, and you can use Averroes in any of those frameworks and more if you want to have support for partial program analysis without changing anything in your analysis framework. If your analysis framework understands class files, you can automatically use Averroes. So with the work that we have done with Averroes and the separate compilation assumption, we were able to scale analyses to some code bases that we were not able to analyze before and reduce the performance, uh, or improve, sorry, the performance of call graph analysis at runtime, reduce the memory requirements for these analyses, and hopefully scale it to even larger code bases. All right. So in, in the second part of my talk, I would like to focus more on the precision of uh, program analyses. 
and how that sometimes actually also has an effect on scalability. So usually you think that I want to make my analysis more precise, so that means I, the analysis has to do more work, so it would be less scalable. But that's actually not true in many cases. Sometimes when you have more precise analysis, that basically means it's reasoning about less facts, so that makes it more scalable in some cases. I'm gonna show you that uh, in a couple of minutes here. So for that part of the talk, I'm gonna focus on security-related static analyses, such as null pointer analysis, trying to reason about which, point, uh, which variables in your code may point to null, or a taint analysis that tracks uh, private data across your program and figure out whether there is a data leak or not, uh, or figure out whether there is some unsanitized uh, values in your program or not. Or a type state analysis that tracks the state of the objects in your program, and it's very helpful in determining things like resource leaks, figuring out whether you have opened too many files uh, and without closing them at the end of your program. All these types of analyses that we need in security are basically static data flow analyses, but we need them to be precise. That's the key thing. We want these analyses to be precise. So what does it mean to have a precise analysis or precise static data flow analysis? So let's assume that piece of code here. To be precise, we need to have two properties of the analysis. The first property is the analysis has to be context sensitive, meaning that I, or the analysis has to differentiate between calls to the same method from different locations in the program. Each one of them would have its own context based on the variables and the arguments that you're passing through that call. The second thing that it needs to be precise is field sensitivity. The analysis has to be able to differentiate between accesses to fields, different fields on the same object and not treat them all the same. So if you have these two properties, then the static data flow analysis is precise enough uh, to be able to uh, compute precise results for you. So one way to obtain both context sensitivity and field sensitivity in the same analysis is through having an abstraction uh, that is commonly used in the field called pushdown automata. By representing variables as a pushdown system that has two things, one stack that represents the stack of calls. Every method call you make is a push on the stack. Every return from a method call would be represented by a pop from that stack and have another separate stack for accesses to the fields. Every write to the field will be a push on the stack. Every read from that field will be a pop from that stack. And by maintaining both stacks of calls and stack of fields, your pushdown automata can actually have both context sensitivity for the method calls, field sensitivity for field accesses. However, that problem is again an undecidable problem. And there is a very nice paper by Tom Reps in Topless, one of the top journals in our community, from the year 2000 that explains why this problem is undecidable and how it reduces from the halting problem, just like pretty much any interesting problem in program analysis that is worth working on. Do you think we're gonna give up? No. We need to find something else to do that. So what do people usually do traditionally in the program analysis community to, come, uh, to work around that undecidability? They're just gonna say the following. We're gonna keep the stack of calls as is, but we're gonna get rid of the stack of fields because that makes the analysis undecidable. And instead, we're gonna settle for an approximation of the property that we want to compute, which is the field accesses. And that approximation uses another abstraction called access paths or access graphs. And you can think of that abstraction as a regular expression that tells you what are the possible field accesses that you may have in your program. So it's just a regular expression that is represented by a graph. The problem with that representation is that it requires what we call a k-limit. So that k-limit is how far you can represent a, 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 a string, or a field access in the object. So a dot b dot c, a dot b dot c dot d, how far you can go deep into an object. And there are two problems with that kind of limitation or that kind of representation. The first problem is how big should k be? And usually the answer is, well, I don't know. I'm just gonna run the analysis multiple times and then figure out a reasonable value for k that fits the needs that I have in the analysis that I want. So you can't decide this a priori for, of, of running the analysis. The second problem is whatever the value of k that you choose, you definitely will have some false positives in your uh, application, uh, sorry, in your analysis results. And these false positives may be too many if you choose a low value of k, a small value of k, they may be too few if you choose a big enough value of k, but at that time, the analysis won't necessarily scale to the code base that you're interested in. So to overcome these two problems, 
we developed a new abstraction called Synchronized Pushdown System Automata, or for short, SPDS. So what does SPDS do? In the original abstraction, it's one analysis that is both context sensitive and field sensitive. So we thought, okay, why don't we just have two analyses rather than one? One of them is context sensitive and the other one is field sensitive and somehow combine the results that we get from both analyses to get the benefit of both worlds. And in our Popple paper earlier this year, we showed that actually that new abstraction that we came up with in SPDS is an over approximation of the original abstraction with one analysis and two stacks. But we also show that the over approximation we were able to push it to exactly one corner case in the, th in, the th in the theory behind the analysis that theoretically does exist, but in practice in all the code that we have analyzed, we have never encountered that corner case. So practically speaking, that corner case does not exist for us. We can, we can get around without handling it. So, okay, so how do we do that? How do we have two analyses and combine the results between both of them? So context sensitive analysis, we know this from the original abstraction. We're just gonna have a stack of calls exactly like the original abstraction, nothing has changed there. The difference now would be in the pushdown system of fields because now we have a separate pushdown automata with a separate stack in a separate analysis. And the way we're going to combine the results of both analyses is that we're going to basically do an intersection of both pushdown automata. We're going to accept words in those two PDAs or pushdown automata that are acceptable in both pushdown systems. And if that word, which is the query that the analysis is trying to answer, or the path in the program that, that the analysis is trying to compute a value for is accepted in both pushdown automata, then we're gonna say that it is accepted in our analysis, so it could happen at runtime, and then we compute the analysis for that uh, path. So now we have an analysis that is both decidable because we worked around that undecidability problem by having two separate analyses and two separate pushdown systems that we just interleave or intersect the results between them. And the most important part, there is no K limiting anymore. I don't have to worry about what's the value of K or have imprecise values uh, from the analysis uh, because I chose a value of K that is too low or too small. So how does SPDS evaluate? So to do the evaluation of SPDS, so here I'm showing a graph on the x-axis, I'm showing the number of field accesses, basically the value of k, right, the k limit. On the x-axis, I'm, I'm showing the runtime of the analysis, how many seconds the analysis takes to finish. And this is done on a contrived benchmark, so not a real world application, but just to show you the differences between the various configurations of k for the original abstraction versus SPDS. So if you have a value of k equals four, you're gonna get a very steep, almost exponential growth in time, uh, uh, depending on uh, your, how large your program is. So that's obviously not that scalable. What if you lower the value of K? So now we are getting less precise results, but in the sake of, or in hopefully, that you're gonna get more scalable analysis. It's not much better. But it's still a little bit more scalable, so that's okay. What if we even lower the precision more? So K equals two. So we get a, a, bit, a bit more scalability of the analysis, but again, we're losing almost half the precision that we had from before. What if we set k equals one? That's perfect. We get a very scalable analysis that's much better than k equals two or three or four, but we almost lose all the sensitivity of field sensitivity, because now when k equals one, all what you can represent is one field axis, a dot f. If you have an object where you're accessing a field of the field of the object, like a dot b dot c, your analysis will just over approximate that to a dot b dot star. So, and in a regular expression, basically, uh, using a regular expression uh, uh, syntax here. So where does SPDS fall in this graph? Where do you think it falls in this diagram here? Do you think it's better than k equals one? Yes, thank you. <laughs> do you think it is worse than k equals four? No, thank you. <laughs> it's actually right before k equals one. So you have scalability of the analysis that is very close to the most scalable setting in the original abstraction, which is k equals one. But the thing to remember here, we don't have any k limit in SPDS, which means basically you have a precision of k equals infinity. So 
for the precision of k equals infinity, you get performance or scalability of the analysis that is very close to the most scalable abstraction in the original analysis. So you may think, and actually, one thing that I forgot to mention here, you may think that some of these k's may not be that uh, big anyways, but we found a case in the Eclipse IDE code base where the field access to, uh, to be able to produce precise analysis, uh, precise results is actually needs a k of value 13. So if your k is less than 13, you're gonna miss that data flow in the program, and if that data flow happens to be a security vulnerability, then tough luck. You have a security vulnerability that you missed in your application just because you don't have a value of k that is uh, reasonable enough. So we all think that, well, you use the contrived experiment here, some toy examples, maybe some benchmarks. So does it really, is it really useful in practice or not? So we actually used this analysis, the SPDS uh, pushdown, uh, synchronized pushdown system, as the analysis engine of a framework and a system that we have implemented called CogniCrypt, uh, which you can actually uh, use as a developer in your IDE to tell you whether you are misusing any crypto API. So if you're misusing a crypto API, the analysis would directly give you a response in the IDE that tells you, yeah, there's a problem here, figure it out. And as you can see now, for example, here in that, uh, in that short video, which may not be playing for some reason. It is? Okay, it's not showing on my machine. All right, so you can see here that you're writing your code, you're choosing a cipher, but you're setting that cipher with an, an, uh, an insecure uh, cipher AES without specifying the block mode. So the analysis would tell you directly in your, in your IDE that there's a problem there. So you as a developer will go ahead, change the value of the cipher, and you will see how fast the analysis would respond. We just save your file, and now it's gone. So that squiggly thing on the left gutter is gone. It's in less than a second, the developer was able to get a response based on that push down system automata analysis. So it is scalable enough to run in an IDE without disrupting the workflow of the developer. So that system now is actually CogniCrypt is now part of the, uh, is released as an open source project as an, under the umbrella of Eclipse. And we welcome contributions from the community uh, to our system there. The other thing that we did, we ran our analysis also on all the Maven artifacts, 2.7 million artifacts. And we found that 68% of them are insecure, which means that they at least have one crypto API misuse in them. Not only that, we ran it on 10,000 recent Android applications from uh, open source Android applications. And recent, that just to say that they have had the most recent security patches to them, so we're not really looking at legacy applications or applications that have been abandoned by their developers. And we found that 95% are insecure. Again, using our uh, CogniCrypt system there. We were also able to find out a security vulnerability, a severe one in the Semantic Norton Identity Safe Android application that led to privilege escalation in the app. And now I can publicly disclose that because it has been fixed and it is now uh, part of the CVA database. So I can talk about it in public, finally. So with the work that we have done with CogniCrypt and SPDS, that's some of the work that we've done to improve the precision of program analysis that also affects how scalable your analysis could be uh, by making it more precise and reason about less facts in the analysis itself. In, the, in this part of my talk, I will quickly touch upon the usability of program analysis tools and how it may affect developers uh, in their normal workflow. Um, uh, because a typical uh, static analysis tool, if you have used one before, you would typically get a report as such, right? Usually in, a, in, in some environment that is different than your development environment. So by the time you already see the analysis reports, you have already forgotten about the feature that is related to that bug report. So you keep switching your context back and forth between those IDEs and between those windows. And if you notice that report closely, you'll see that the critical issues that you may need to fix for this specific code base is more than 4,000 issues. So you as a developer would need to fix all those issues before you can ship or deploy your application. So of course, all of you are thrilled to see that kind of report. Um, of course not, you're not. Um, so what do we do? How do we make developers happier about static analysis tools? The first thing developers probably want and need is an analysis tool that is very precise, doesn't have too many false positives, an analysis tool that is responsive so that they can use it in their IDE, in their development environment without having to switch between different applications, 
and also seamless integration into their IDE, and something that is customized to their behavior and how they are using the, uh, the, the analysis and the applications that they are developing. There are many studies that has been done in the programming language community and the software engineering community that talk about what are the features that developers would like to have in their tools to be able to use it, in their static analysis tools to be able to use it, and what are the kind of things that developers don't like to have uh, and make them not uh, or abandon uh, these static analysis tools. So to leverage all that knowledge that has been accumulated over the years from the community, we developed a framework called Just-in-Time Static Analysis. Pun intended in the title, by the way. Just-in-Time and Static usually don't go hand in hand in our community. So what is Just-in-Time Static Analysis? This is just a snapshot of how it looks like in the IDE. So we basically use a layered approach to program analysis that basically unpeels parts of the code uh, starting from the point where the developer is currently at, basically your current edit point, and then gives you results as it finds them along the way. So it doesn't wait until the whole analysis is done to give you the result or the report, but it reports those results as it goes. And the nice thing about it is that you don't have to wait for hours or minutes to start working on those bug fixes, but you can actually start working on them right away while the analysis is computing the rest of the results in the, back end, uh, in the background. And in our user studies, we actually were able to show that developers using our IDE, or PETA, uh, the, the name of our IDE, twice as fast compared to traditional static analysis tools. And that was really the result that we wanted to see out of the study, that we, just by changing something fundamental in how the analysis works, we can actually make developers use it, hopefully, uh, more and make use of uh, the potential of program analysis more than uh, it already is. So this is some of, like, just briefly, some of the things that we have worked on with respect to usability of static analysis tools. So, so far I've talked about scalability, precision, and usability of static analysis tools, some of the challenges that we have seen on how we have worked to improve each one of them. So where do we go from here? What does the future hold for program analysis? So some of the work that my group has been up to is, the first one is building an analysis framework for Swift that is based on top of Walla, the IBM industry-grade analysis framework. And the nice thing about it is that it has support for multiple different languages. So now we can support modern software systems where you have something like Swift for TensorFlow. You have Swift code, you have Python code, and they both interact with each other in some way. And you want to reason about a program that is no longer in one language or no longer uses one compiler. So Swan or the Swift analysis framework would allow us to do something like that or using program analysis in contexts that previously haven't seen usage of program analysis, like using it at runtime in the JIT compiler or the just-in-time compiler in a VM, and use that to estimate post-inlining transformations to make better inlining decisions at runtime using abstract interpretation, something that I never thought I would be able to do a few years ago. Or even using program analysis in, terms, uh, in, in the form of symbolic execution in solver-aided languages that are really powerful, such as Rosette, that allow you to uh, reason about uh, symbols in your program without having concrete values for them, to fix errors that you may find in neural networks without having to retrain that neural network again, which is some work that I've been doing with uh, some undergrads, actually, in our department, a really brilliant undergrad in our department uh, in the past year or so. And I'm also happy to see the uptake of static analysis in the last few years from different companies such as Google, for example, who is now using static analysis to make sure that uh, and report security vulnerabilities in Android applications to the developers before they approve the app in their Play Store, just to reduce the amount of security vulnerabilities in those applications. Or the various analysis frameworks and tools that Facebook deploys uh, to be able to have static analysis at large and scale to hundreds of lines of millions of code and even automatically repair those pieces of code, like Facebook Sapfix, for example, does that. It will automatically not just detect, but also fix those errors uh, in these code bases. You can also now continue, uh, have a continuous security analysis running in your public GitHub repository thanks to SEML uh, that will tell you whether there are security vulnerabilities in your, in your uh, repository or not. So I think with all that work and with all what has been happening uh, and also the challenges that we have been seeing in the, in the PL community, like with quantum computing, with AI and machine learning, I think that the future of program analysis is really vibrant and there are a lot of interesting research challenges ahead of us that we're going to be tackling in the next few years. So let me now quickly wrap up what I've been talking about today. So first I showed you a few examples of bugs and errors that I think program analysis can help detect and also fix. 
And I showed you some of the contexts that I think program analysis is useful in, like compiler optimization, developer support tools, program verification, and security. The three main challenges that I think uh, do not allow developers to make use of the full potential of program analysis and specifically static analysis in practice, and some of the contributions that we were able to make to improve the status quo of those three uh, main challenges, and also briefly talked about some of the future work that I see in program analysis that I think will shape the next few years in the program analysis research. And with that, I'd like to thank you all, and I'm happy to take any of your questions.